because in this case, sometimes we talk more, we talk more on um, uh, uh, the employer because we are we are trying to uh, we are trying to make sure that um, uh, people maintain their rights in an employment relationship because even though we are talking about servant and master, as far as the present day is concerned, employment is more of a property right to the employee. Employment disengage an employee, you must do the right thing. If not, the employee damages, the company will pay a lot of damages. So we're saying that this type of contract provides for termination by either party giving a notice of termination that has already been agreed by both party. So in this case, the termination, the notice of termination is already agreed by both party. And what is the agreement uh, tool? The agreement tool is the employment letter. That is why I said, you have to go back to the employment letter to look at what are the terms and conditions of employment before you terminate any employee. And we said that though the Labor Act prescribed notice period of the termination of contract, in practice, the employer and employee entering into a contract of service still define notice period through the employment contract, a bracket uh, open as contained in the employment letter. Now, if you look at the Labor Act, there is no contract, there is no notice that is up to two months or three months. But in real, in, in the real life, when we talk about what happens in the organization, some of these contracts are of three months, some are two months. And as long as people have signed, expressly signed, you know, that contract becomes binding to them. So the contract of employment is very, very important. Can we go to the next slide? Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Now, notice to terminate a contract of employment. One, we're saying that notice to terminate a contract of employment must be specific and unequivocal. Specific in the sense that you cannot tell an employee or an employee cannot tell an employer that uh, I, I will want to, I will, I will terminate your employment uh, sometime this year. It is not specific. You can never say uh, that please excuse I'm going me. to. Uh, please excuse me, Mr. Frederick. You have less than. Uh, okay. You have less than eight minutes to go. Please. Okay. Thank okay. you. We appreciate you. Okay. Okay. So, so the, the notice uh, we said, okay, must be uh, specific. The time begins to run when the notice is served on the other party. The contract expires at the expiration of the notice. So if you are talking about notice of one month, uh, of course, uh, we are going to talk about it again, that the day you submit the notice, that day is not counting. Uh, you submit it today, so you give the letter today, the notice starts within uh, tomorrow. Um, also, said, the notice does not become effective until the day of its expiration or when the employee stops coming to work, even if it is earlier than the notice expiring date. Uh, please go to the next one. Next slide, please. Okay, um, the notice to terminate the contract of employment so that a formal acceptance of notice of resignation is not, uh, is, is unnecessary. Sometimes people begin to say that, oh, you're going to give, you know, that I have not accepted your resignation. Whether you accept the resignation or you do not accept the resignation, that does not mean that that uh, resignation is not, uh, is not binding. You don't actually need to accept it. It is not to mean that you cannot accept it, but if you choose not to accept it, it is not, it is not to invalidate uh, the process. I also say that it is likely that notice of termination can be withdrawn when the other party has not accepted the resignation. I'm not trying to contradict myself. In this case, maybe let's say uh, an account officer or a human resource supervisor, uh, a human resource officer submit the letter to the human resource supervisor who is not the main person. You know, at that point, it can be withdrawn, but immediately it gets to the human resource manager, it might not be withdrawn again. I would say that any notice that would be for a period of one week or more must be in writing because it has to be in writing if it is going to be one week or more. Can we go further? Go further. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, payment in lieu. 
when a contract of employment has an alternative provision of payment in lieu of notice, the payment in lieu must accompany the termination letter and not to be paid later. Sometimes I take very note of this. Most of the times when I terminate, I make sure that as you are getting your termination letter, you're also having your pay for the notice. So it's not going to be like, uh, it's going to be at the end of the month. Anytime, anything done like that is wrongful termination. It could destroy the entire termination process. It is not enough to offer a pay salary, to, to pay salary in lieu of notice without accompanying the payment at the point of termination. Can we go further? They are very, very self-explanatory. Can we go further, please? Next slide. Okay, wrongful termination. Wrongful termination of contract of service is when the contract of employment is brought to an end in breach of its term and condition or by other means regarded by law or uh, as unlawful. There are remedies which we are not going to uh, talk about that. Now, as we said, anybody, any party can terminate, but it has to be on by notice or payment in lieu of notice. Now, when you come to I mean, when you come to dismissal, dismissal is only done when the person has um, committed a misconduct. And the normal process of disciplinary procedure process where the person is queried, the person is uh, the, the principle of national justice is actually followed, and all these ones, and the person has been found culpable. It is at that point that the person can be dismissed. So you don't just dismiss somebody in the way you could terminate uh, someone. So dismissal is something that is is more is more because you have to give reasons when you 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 you, you dismiss. In termination, you might not need to give reasons, but where where the person is uh, the person the person disagrees, maybe objected somehow, then you can justify it uh, in, in termination. I think that is where my presentation ends. Thank you very much. So I was saying that um, for copyright, you have civil and criminal liabilities, and that the fact that a person, uh, an offender has uh, been, uh, has has been uh, um, charged criminally does not uh, preclude him from getting the, the complainant from getting his civil rights of um, 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 getting all his rights as an injunction, damages, uh, et cetera, delivery of and some pillar injunctions and all of that. So there is a double edged uh, sword in the sense that there are criminal liabilities. And the criminal aspect, the, the, the prosecutors are usually uh, um, uh, the prosecutors from the National Copyright Commission. They are the ones who usually prosecute the offenders while the, the complainant enjoys uh, his civil remedies by going to court. Now, I have two cases uh, on hand. I have the case of um, NCC versus uh, Sunday. Ayo Dele, uh, he was accused, uh, was charged with possession and offering for sale of optical discs over 1.5 million. Now under the Copyright Act, um, the, the penalty for this is 100 Naira for every page of infringing work. And uh, he was charged for uh, two years imprisonment or um, a, a penalty of 250,000. Then you have the other case of NCC uh, uh, versus uh, Mr. Godwin, uh, he was convicted for uh, broadcasting uh, high TV channels uh, without authority. He was charged uh, six years in total imprisonment, but they were to run concurrently. Uh, um, but in the end, he was uh, charged. As they ran concurrently, he got two years in imprisonment. Now, the, the query is the, uh, whether the penalties for this copyright infringement is really adequate. I would think that it's not. The, the penalties are not adequate. In fact, there have been recommendations from some quarters that, um, that fines do not deter the infringers because by the time they look at the fine they pay and compare it to what they are going to gain, they feel that it's better to keep on offending. So we are, uh, we are looking at a situation, recommending a situation where Infringers are warned and they are penalized based on first warning and all of that. There's also the issue of what you call fair use, where in the social media or LinkedIn, where people uh, publish other people's works. And there has been a lot of um, 
argument about fair use. And the court usually considers the issue of fair use based on the nature of the work, uh, the effects on the market and all of that. So it has been recommended in some quarters that instead of copying wholesale somebody's copyright, you just share the link of that work. That's that way you can actually have a defense and reduce the likelihood of conflict. Because when you share the link, the person, the researcher goes straight to the page of the owner of the copyright. Okay. So um, the next slide, uh, number 21, is trademark. That's another intellectual property that deals with and signs, brand names. Now, as an administrator, it's good to start looking at these things. Like I was saying before, if you heard me, um, sometimes uh, most people don't look at the brand names of what they are using. I want us to start learning to look at it. Now, um, a, a, a trademark is a sign that distinguishes your goods and services. It comes in forms of logos, uh, words, names, designs, letters, you look at some, you know, the Coca-Cola bottle, some of them enjoy even multiple intellectual property. You have design, which we're going to look at, and then you still have the trademark. Now, but before a, tra a trademark can be registrable, it must be distinctive that there should not be any other trademark that is so similar with it that it can cause confusion. It should not be deceptive and uh, contrary to law and morality. Contrary to law and morality, it, that it should not um, perpetuate something that is illegal and it should not be immoral. Now, the remedies for breach of uh, trademark are, and they are, general, this, uh, they are the general remedies for all IPRO uh, offenses, injunction damages, account for profit, and the uh, delivery of, to deliver up the offending items. Now, the benefits of trademark is that you have exclusive use of the, the trademark and you have the right to sue any, anybody who infringes the trademark. You have the right to renew the, the trademark indefinitely and uh, they enjoy uh, the remedies. Now, a, a side of a trademark is a passing off. Now, passing off is a common law and equitable ready for registered trademark. A person, uh, a, an inventor, a creator of an intellectual, a writer, an artist who has not registered his invention can enjoy passing off. It's a common law, equitable remedy. The lawyers will know what the common law is. It's the law that, 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 that existed before the, the statutory laws and it's equitable, it's a fair law. So a company or a person who has built a reputation for himself because of his invention, can stop another person from using it even though he's not registered. He has built a name for himself. Now I have examples like uh, the C, I just noticed when I was looking at these trademarks that the Seaway bottle is not a registered trademark, yet everybody knows the word Seaway. And it's supposed to be a trademark. And then I have fallen victim to the fact that I bought a D-Way bottle not knowing that it was not seaway. It was when I tested the water that I looked at it again and realized that this was an infringement. So because they were not registered, they are not registered, does that mean their, their invention or their creativity will go to naught? Now that is where passing off comes in to save the inventor. Before a person can enjoy passing off, he must be able to establish three each points. First, that you have a reputation and a goodwill among people, the common man, that you have, that uh, the, the uh, offender has misrepresented by his representation, has caused confusion concerning your product so that people are beginning to think that his product is your product. And that's because of that misrepresentation, you have soft, uh, suffered damages. So a person who is able to prove this three will be able to enjoy, um, be able to enjoy uh, uh, this um, passing off. So uh, the procedure for registration of trademark is very simple. An applicant uh, makes his application at uh, the registry of the trademark. And then once he makes his application, searches are done to see if there is any similar trademark. And then if it passes, then the, the, the registrar begins to look at the trademark to see uh, whether the, uh, his examination is substantive. He's, been, he's going to be looking at whether it is compliant 
to the law, to the morality, that it is distinctive. If he finds that it's compliant with the law, he accepts the trademark. Please look at my chart, number four on the box. He accepts the trademark. If he does not, on the third bar, he refused this, and then there is a hearing. Now, this hearing is where it must be, it must be done within two months of the refusal, where the applicant now brings a, a, a petition, as it were, complaining and trying to ask the, uh, telling the registrar that there is need to reconsider his uh, mark. So it's an ex parte hearing in the sense that the applicant will not be there during the hearing. And then uh, if, if he succeeds, it is published in the trademark journal. If it was accepted in the first instance, it's also published. Now, after publication uh, um, on the trademark, they, within two months, anybody who is opposing the publication, that's a second chance to uh, oppose, should uh, make his opposition within two months. If it is not opposed, the trademark is registered. If it is opposed, there is an inter-party hearing. In this, in this hearing, all the parties will be present to make their representation concerning their trademark. That's the procedure for uh, registration of trademark. The next one uh, we are looking at is patent. Patent is a, is a registered right that protects industrial inventions, inventions uh, such as uh, Industrial inventions will mean like helicopters, uh, um, microwaves, washing machines, uh, sewing machines, up to 20 years. Um, the application process for, for uh, patents is quite rigorous so th and protracted, and because it, 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 it in a bid to prevent undeserving people from applying and wasting time. Uh, it's a, the, the, the 20 year period that is given to patent is, is just to enable the, the inventor to enjoy the fruit of his labor for a while. Now, to be patentable, an invention must have three important qualifications. It must be new, that is, nobody has ever uh, made such an invention. It must result from an inventive activity. That means that. Look at those who are in that field, if it is a kind of a marine thing or, or electrical, nobody in that field should be able to understand or know about that invention. And it has never been displayed anywhere in the world and it must be capable of industrial application. So uh, in, in, uh, when uh, he has fulfilled this, he must describe the invention. He will use maps and graphs to describe the invention so thoroughly that someone who doesn't know about the invention can use that description to create it. The reason for that description is to ensure that after the 20 years in a, a, a patent, someone else can now, people can now have their own version. So after Mercedes-Benz, the first vehicle came out, there was a patent. Then we now had Mercedes-Benz, we had Japanese car, we have different brands. But the original patent showed how a car could be driven. So um, the benefits of uh, patent protection, of course, is clear that the, the, the inventor or the patentee enjoys his monopoly for 20 years, and he has the right to license it out, give it out for, for that period. He has the right to take legal action against any infringer, and uh, he has the right to stop anybody from using his invention. And the, uh, the benefit of patent that is that that description has become a, a, a very comprehensive source of technical information worldwide, because such a description is so thorough that um, anybody in the world can use it to make his own kind of invention. Um, now, procedurally, the, the, uh, the, the procedure for registration of patent is that the applicant uh, fills in his particulars to the register of patents, describing his invention. Now, that description, like I, I said before, is very, very relevant. It needs to be thorough and very elaborate and comprehensive. And the invention, a, a, a patent, relates to only one claim. But in recent times, there have been a lot of changes in the application of a patent in, in the real world. We now have, it, it, it's no longer about one invention. You now have a, a, a torch that has a radio. You have um, a, 
a, a, a, refri a refrigerator that has a, a, a hot section and all of that. You now have double inventions. So there's need to actually uh, amend the laws because in the in emerging trend of things, it's no longer applicable that the, the invention will apply to only one process. So the registrar examines the, the patent application. His application is not substantive as in the case of the registrar. His, uh, his, uh, his uh, um, uh, examination is just formal to see that it's compliant with the formal provisions of the law. Um, so once the provisions for patentability is given, uh, uh, um, then a letter of patent is delivered, but it takes quite a while. Now the, the, the industrial design, uh, um, the law for industrial design is, is combined with patents. Now the industrial design is just about the aesthetic appearance of a product. So a product can have industrial design and still have a registered trademark. So just to have a double protection. Slides are elaborate enough for us to uh, get all I, I, I have for you. Just to say that um, um, the emerging trend now is, is domain name, cyber sporting. We, we now, because of the internet, uh, we, have, we have domain names um, and um, there is a lot of um, um, offenses that have come about having domain names under the cyber crime, the cyber crime law where people now who have trademarks go and create domain names so that uh, they can sell it at a gain. So it, it is, uh, it, it's the responsibility of the corporate administrator to be very vast in this kind of thing, to ensure that they, 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 their websites are not uh, stolen and people go and uh, showcase themselves, especially for organizations that are doing very well, that their websites are not taken by interlopers who just go around shopping around for where they can steal uh, the industry of an organization. Thank you very much for your time. Dr. James Yadonha is a lecturer and associate professor of the of Niger Delta University, Bielsa State. He is well grounded in the field of accountancy, having studied purely accounting at various academic uh, levels from BSc level to PhD between 2000 and 2016. Uh, Delta State Hospital Management Board from 1992 to 1999 as a clerical officer, lecturer by Elsa State College of Arts and Science from 2002 to 2011, and assistant director of finance, Ninja Delta Seafood Company from 2009 to 2011. Dr. James is married to Dr. Mrs. Tupelebi Yadonga, and they have four lovely kids. We now invite you to deal on the topic, understanding financial statement and taxation. You are welcome. So as I was saying, the financial statements need to be reliable and they need also to be timely because when financial statements are not timely, the purpose for which they are prepared to make decision will not be achieved. That is why financial statements need to be timely. And the preparation of financial statements also require that they are to be relevant, relevant to the needs of those who want to make use of the financial statement in decision making. If the information content is not relevant for the purpose for which it is going to be used, then that information will become useless. And that is why the relevance of financial statement is a, a very important criteria in the preparation of financial statements in an organization. Next slide. However, when financial statements are prepared, for them to be reliable, relevant, and timely, they need to be guided by some specific standards. The reason why these standards are provided is to ensure that the financial statements prepared by one person in a certain region of the world or in a country can also be duplicated by another person who will use the same data in preparing the financial statement in another part of the world and arrive at the same uh, information. And who are the users of these financial statements? Shareholders need to use financial statement in making decisions. And also directors and managers of organizations also need financial statements. Corporate secretaries also need financial statements. 
because they disseminate information in an organization. Creditors and even government and employees need financial statement. Industries and firms also need financial statements seriously in order to help them to make proper assessment, self-evaluation, and whether the organization is meeting up in the committee of other organizations in the same industry. Scholars also needed financial statement so that they will be able to continue to make research on what is going on in the corporate world. So have a look at these users of financial statement. We want to look at the structure of financial statement. Next slide, please. When we talk about the structure of financial statement, we are practically looking at what we call International Accounting Standard 1, IAS 1. In IAS 1, it provided the content of the financial statement and the types of financial statements to be prepared in an organization. IAS 1 provided that, first of all, every financial statement should be able to provide a statement of financial position. Before this time, we used to call it a balance sheet statement. And a statement of financial position is a statement of the assets and liabilities of the organization, which are the key things that makes up an organization. And this is where we derive the accounting equation, which says that assets must be equal to liability. So when assets are not equal to a liability, that particular organization will be undergoing some kind of a, a financial a problem or corporate problems. That is why in accounting, when assets and liabilities fail to balance, we do what we call capital reorganization and reconstructioning so that we now balance the assets and liabilities of an organization. The second statement IAS1 provided is the profit and loss account or the income statement. The income statement is the statement portraying the actual financial transactions that took place in an organization and helping management to know whether the financial transactions all through the year were profitable or they were not profitable. That's why the net result of the income statement is the net profit of the organization. Then we also have the statement of changes in owner's equity. The statement of changes in equity is just about letting the shareholders know the movement of their net worth at the end of the accounting period. Well, the shareholders have provided money, capital, to form the organization. At the end of the accounting period, the organization should be able to report back to them whether the money they invested in the company and managed by the managers or the directors of the organization have been able to improve the cash flow statement help us to understand inflow, the outflow of cash. Look at the slide there. You will see the statement of financial position as non-current asset. Non-current assets are Non-current assets are like land and building, uh, machinery, factory machinery, and the rest of them. They are the non-current assets. Then we have the current assets, which can easily be converted to cash, which has to do with cash and bank balance and the rest of them. Then we also have the deferred charges, sometimes called intangible assets. These assets, like the the uh, barrister that presented patent rights, deferred payments, and the uh, goodwill are recorded as deferred charges or intangible assets. Now, on the area of liability, we have the owner's equity. The owner's equity is like uh, what the providers of fund have given to the organization, either as ordinary share capital, revenue reserve, capital reserve and the rest of them. Then we have the long-term liability, which is also called the non-current liability and the current liability. The essence of the statement of financial position is very important in making investment decisions in an organization. We use it to also determine whether a financial statement or an organization is going to continue based on the going concern concept of every organization. It will also help us to understand whether the company is stable, whether it's uh, solvent, whether it's going to be 
having some kind of liquidity problem in the future, we make all those ratio analysis from the statement of financial position. Next slide, please. The next one we have uh, is the income statement. The income statement, or sometimes called the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. This income statement reports what we call nominal transactions. Nominal transactions in accounting refers to those transactions that uh, you pay for and you do not actually sometimes get the, the, the physical value of what you have paid for, like salaries. An organization may pay for salary, but you do not get a physical value for the salary you have paid. Another type of nominal is uh, that of uh, um, distribution cost or administrative expenses incurred in an organization. These are nominal items we paid for without actually receiving a physical value of what we paid for. Now, in the income statement, the next result, as I've mentioned before, is a profit. The income statement is also very key in the process of decision making. It helps organizations to know whether their investments are returning earnings for them. And that's why we prepare the earnings per share of every organization after preparing the income statement, which is a key element in the determination of uh, earnings. So as you can see in the slide there, the income statement has a standard format. This is a general format for all organizations, but specific formats are prepared for banks, for insurance companies, and also for manufacturing organizations and some other petroleum organizations. But this general format is what is uh, most times being used in examining students, particularly in some professional bodies so that secretaries should know, need to know a knowledge of the general format of the income statement. When we talk about income, the first thing that should come to our mind is revenue. The revenue is realized on sales. It's a nominal accounting item. The next one we have is cost of sales. What and what did you do, spend on, to realize the revenue? In most times, the cost of sales is related to the cost of building up the stock or the inventory that was sold to realize that revenue. Then when we minus the cost of sales from revenue, we arrive at gross profit. This part of the income statement is often referred to as a trading account. Trading because that part captures the core business transaction of the organization before we look at other peripheries that comes into the transactions. Then after the gross profit, we now want to less any cost from distribution, any cost incurred the uh, administrative units, any cost from finance, then we now have other investment incomes. Now there's a particular thing I would like to explain here. Why do we not add investment income to revenue in this statement of a uh, profit or loss or other comprehensive income? The reason is simple. When you register a company, there's what we call the object clause. In the object clause, you have stated what type of business you are going to carry out in the name of that company. And the type of business you will carry out in the name of that company, the, the, the resulting income from that business you have registered as a core business of the organization is what we refer as operating income. But that doesn't mean that businesses will not have other outside incomes from that particular operating income. A business may be dealing on the sales of, say, cement. But sometimes that business may decide to hire Will Biro to some other persons or at Pan, which is not part of the sales of cement, except the building, the business is built for building materials. If it is registered for the sale of cement and you begin to hire Will Biro, those other incomes coming from these peripheral uh, activities, we gather them together and give it its own heading as investment income. Some other financial statements, we call it other income. So that is why we separate it from revenue to help the users of financial statement understand that, see, this revenue is a core income we realize from the business. These other incomes are peripheral incomes. Then we also have the income, other comprehensive income. The other comprehensive income is that income 
in most instances, is also a nominal income. Sometimes it does not uh, arrive at the actual realization of income when we mention other comprehensive income. For example, a building belonging to a firm has been revalued upward. The building might be 50 million and it has been revalued to uh, 60 million. That means the organization has earned an income from the revaluation of that business or that building, which is an asset of the organization. Those kind of incomes that are non-nominal are recorded as other comprehensive income. And of course, businesses must always pay tax. And that is why we less the tax element for the year from the profit and loss account. Next slide, please. The next one we are going to look at is the cash flow statement as required by IAS 7. The cash flow statement records the inflow of cash and the outflow of cash for an organization for a whole year. And me, I think that the cash flow statement is like a, a cash audit of an organization for a year. And why is the cash flow statement very important? The ratios will calculate from cash flow statement indicate whether an organization is liquid or it is not liquid. In corporate organizations or corporate financial management, we often look at what we call liquidity and profitability balance. If a firm is extremely liquid, that, pro that company will not be making profit because it will be storing, holding its cash at hand without reinvesting it. There will be cash lying idle in the organization or either in the banks. If also a firm is extremely profitable, that means that firm is also facing some kind of problem because it will run at a loss when business opportunities unplanned for may arise in the future. The firm will not have sufficient money to invest in those opportunities. And so the cash flow statement helps us to determine how liquid a particular firm is or how profitable a firm is. And the cash flow statement normally have three main headings. We have cash flow from operating activities. We have cash flow from investing activities. And we also have cash flow from financing activities. The operating activities are those cash flows that brings in money and takes out money from items in the profit and loss account and current and non-current assets and liabilities. While the cash flow from investing activities our money spent on assets which have the potential to generate income for the organization for a given period of time, not just months, years. Investment in those assets are outwards of cash outflows. Then when those assets are sold, then they are considered as cash inflows. Then we also have the financing, uh, uh, financing activities. The financial activities are those activities that has to do with sourcing for fund capital to finance a business. For example, if a company is making new share issue, either ordinary share or preferred share capital, that is an inflow of cash under financing activity. A company is taking a long-term loan from development banks or bank of industry to finance its project, that is cash flow from uh, financing activities. Then when the company begins to pay back these loans or decide to pay dividend or interest to these people who provided this source of capital, they are outflows from financing activities. So that part of the cash flow statement too is key when we look at how much the company is paying out from that aspect. But a very good summary of the cash flow statement is that when cash inflow of an organization is coming more from investing activities rather than operating activities. It's a signal that that organization is sick financially. It means that the organization is keep selling out its assets without necessarily making profits in the organization. And we know in the Nigerian corporate organization, we are not allowed to sell assets. Companies are not just willing to sell assets because the assets are the representation of the capital of that company, except the assets have become wear and tear or impaired, or the assets have become obsolete, then the organization can begin to sell them. 
So when so much cash flow is coming into an organization from investing activity, it's a signal that that organization is sick. Then we have the cash and cash equivalent. Sometimes when we talk about cash equivalent, people get confused. What is cash equivalent? The cash equivalent has to do with those current assets that are near cash in nature. Cash, bank, and then marketable securities, treasury bills, promising notes, bank notes, these are cash equivalents. But when we talk about stock, debtors, they are not cash equivalent. So these are items that can easily be converted to cash. At a twinkle of an eye, you can make it cash and use it to pay for the settlement of a debt. Next slide. So these are the basic financial statements I've mentioned, the statement of financial position, the income statement, the cash flow. Now, when financial statements are prepared, there's what we call fair presentation of financial statement. Because the financial statement required to be used by investors, it need to be fairly presented. So IFRS 1 help us understand that financial statement of a company can only be considered to be fairly presented if it follows all relevant accounting standards. And that clause is a very important thing. All relevant accounting standards relating to the preparation of any of these statements or relating to the organization that is preparing the financial statement must be complied with. That is when the financial statements will be considered to be fairly presented. Another thing about fair presentation of financial statement is that the financial statement should be presented in a going concern basis. Going concern means that an organization is not a human being. It is not expected to die tomorrow. If organizations, businesses, firms continues to die like power or human being, then the economy will crumble. That is why I remember sometimes whether in Babangida era, he set up the failed bank tribunal to try those who are responsible in making banks to fail in Nigeria. So anyone who makes a company to fail is a criminal act because once all the companies die, then that company, that economy will crumble. For that reason, when we prepare the financial statement, we prepare them with the assumption that the companies will continue to exist for the foreseeable number of uh, years. And that is why we have something like Lever Brothers and all those old companies that existed before Nigeria became an independence. So that the financial, the companies will continue to exist and the financial statements are prepared in that manner to ensure that there is great consent um, a representation in the preparation of financial statements. Next slide. Now, when we prepare financial statements, there are very important factors we want to consider. First, the basis of accounting. Every organization must have a basis of accounting. Practically, we have two bases of accounting. Government use the cash basis of accounting. Why government uses cash basis of accounting is because most of the accountants in the public sector are not professional accountants. Some of them might have studied economics, some have studied statistics, some business administration. So they now use the cash basis, which is a very simple basis of accounting so that they can easily be understood. Another reason why government uses the cash basis is because of the volume of transactions. So when they use the cash basis, they can now avoid some of the transactions that would have been recorded to reduce, to compress the content of the information. For example, government do not recognize creditors and debtors. Government do not recognize assets. That is why we also have the problem of abandoned projects. When one government comes in, it will now come up with its own policy and then the projects that were being executed by the previous government are abandoned because they do not keep record of where and how much has been spent not that they don't keep record, but in the final account, they do not prepare it in a way that someone will go back and look at it. Then the second basis is the accrual basis of accounting. The accrual basis of accounting recognizes um, liabilities, debts, and creditors. It ensures that what is to be paid this year, a provision is made for it to be paid, even if it wasn't paid this year. The following accounting year, 
the provision is made for it to be paid. While in the cash basis of accounting, what is being owned this year, there is no provision for it to be paid next year, except the government in power wish to pay for it. That is one key difference between the cash basis of accounting and the accrual basis of accounting. The accrual basis of accounting is practiced in the corporate world, while the cash basis of accounting is practiced in the public sector. Although presently, most organizations in the public sector are now using an hybrid of the accrual and the cash basis of accounting, particularly bigger institutions, NNPC, they now make an hybrid or a combination of the cash and the accrual basis of accounting in their final accounts. Then judgment. There is no way we can prepare financial statements without judgments. For example, the preparation of depreciation on assets being used to generate income. How much is the depreciation to be taken for a particular period is a judgment by the directors. So the directors decide that this year, let's take 5% on depreciation on this asset. Let's take 10% on depreciation on this asset. Those are counting judgments. And these judgments are based on accrual basis of accounting. Another area of accounting judgment is the provision of reserves, the provision of reserves. When we look at our income statement, you will see in company records, um, reserve, capital reserve, revenue reserve. Sometimes those reserves are made by judgment. This year, how much of our retained earning are we keeping aside for expansion when the need beats? It's a judgmental issue. So accounting preparation of financial statement is full of judgment. And that is why the accounting standards are very important to guide us in making the kind of judgments we do. One big thing that will, is very important in the case of judgment is the determination of goodwill, the value of goodwill. We are also talking about patent rights. What is the value of that patent right in judgment? There is no actual cost on patent rights. There's no actual cost on goodwill, but people have to make judgment. But the accounting standards are provided in a way that the judgments are not made arbitrarily. Directors are not given that freedom to just decide that for this year, our goodwill is 20 million naira, and it carries in the financial statement. At the end of the day, the financial statement will look very attractive and deceive investors to come and invest. There are stringent guidelines guiding the preparation or the making of judgments. Then we also have uncertainties. Sometimes when some kind of uncertainties occur, we also make use of judgment. For instance, a company may be having a, a case in a law court, a pending case. The judgment of that case will affect the, the, the status of the company, the survival of the company in the future. So in the situation like that, I will make provisions for those kind of uh, contingencies that may arise as a result of cases that are pending. Then we would also want to talk about the domiciliation and the legal status of an organization, the dividends paid, the assets and liability. So when we prepare financial statement, there's what we call disclosure. These items I've mentioned here should be disclosed. They are not figures. They are to be explained in words as notes at the end of the financial statement that this is the case we are having. If this case becomes like this, this is going to be the effect on this particular item in the financial statement. Those kind of disclosures are also requirements that must be provided in the financial statement. Next slide. That is about financial statement. I want to talk about taxation since the, the presentation is about financial statement and taxation. Now taxation, as we know, is that part which is paid from any income, whether N or on N, to government for being a citizen, for having a business in the country, for having practicing a profession, and for having a trade or employment in the country. So that is why taxation is being paid by every individual except minors. When we talk about individual, corporate organizations are also individuals or corporate beings. And so they earn income, they have a place of domiciliation, they have a name, they have a the certificate of a registration, which is like the birth certificate of a human being. That is why companies and individuals all pay tax to the government. And when they pay tax to the government, 
they ensure that the tax paid is properly recorded. And when we pay tax, sometimes the payment of tax does not bring joy to most people. But that doesn't mean that we will not pay tax. It's part of our corporate um, citizenship as companies and also as individuals. It's part of our, the liability of being a citizen of a country. Without tax, no country will be able to survive. Although in Nigeria, we have come to realize that tax revenue is not a very important source of survival of the nation because of the uh, oil industry where everybody is looking for quick money in order to uh, run the activities. The next slide. Now, we want to look at the history of taxation. Taxation started before our colonial masters arrived. We know that in the Eastern world, the Igbo land, there was no fixed tax paid, but people were still paying tax. They were paying tax because they were, their tax were based on compulsory and joyful labors. Sometimes age groups, sometimes uh, members of a community will want to achieve a particular thing. They will call themselves and then from there, they will be able to work for it. In the North, there was a well-established tax system before the colonial masters arrived. People pay cow tax. People also pay some kind of tax to their emirs. All these kind of tax were existing before the colonial masters came in. However, tax has always been seen as something that is not always attractive to people. That is why in the 1916, we had the uh, Oyo riot. This led to, that is the Shein riot, rising of tax. Then some other times later, Lord Lugard introduced uh, different types of tax. We have uh, one of them in uh, 1904, which passes through different amendments. And uh, finally, we now have different types of tax today. Basically, at this particular time, we have a very established tax structure, a structure that determines how much to be paid as a rate, determine the income to be charged, determine the allowances to be given to the taxpayers and other reliefs, either as individuals or corporate beings. Next slide. Now let's look at the types of tax in Nigeria and relevant tax laws and authority. One of the important taxes we have in Nigeria is the Personal Income Tax Act, Act 8 of the laws of the Federal Republic of Nigeria of 2004. That tax is to be made payable by individuals, not corporate beings. Then we also have the Companies Income Tax which is the Tax Act Cap 21 of the laws of the Federal Republic of Nigeria of 2004. They are all amended anyway, not that these laws came into existence in 2004, but they were given their present structure in 2004. We also have the Petroleum Profit Tax. We have the Capital Gain Tax. The Petroleum Profit Tax is a tax provided for petroleum prospecting industries and companies in Nigeria to pay. The Capital Gain Tax has to do with transfer of assets or gain in capital. Then we also have the value added tax, which replaced the Nigerian sales tax. We realize that taxing transactions will be able to make, or consumption will be able to make uh, enough money for the country. That is why we have VAT. And VAT is very important because if you look at the Nigerian environment, our propensity to consume is higher than our propensity to save. It's very high. Our propensity to consume in Nigeria is very high compared to other developed nations, their propensity to consume is low and their propensity to save is high. That's why they can save to make, pro make provision for recreation, refreshment, go on holiday. I've not seen a Nigerian average civil servant telling his family members that I want to take a leave and go on holiday for some time. It's because our propensity to consume is very high. And when government noticed that we have a very high propensity to consume, they decided to introduce the value added tax. And of recent, we know that Lagos State is making the highest revenue from value added tax. 
although it's a federal tax being shared by the state uh, uh, federation and the local government but that tax is actually very important to us because of our nature we also have the education tax act education tax is paid by companies from excess income the reason is because when companies invest part of their social uh, uh, corporate responsibility should also be to improve the education of the people because when we're in the colonial world and in the era of slavery slaves were not allowed to acquire education and so they were being uh, dominated but when they became educated it was difficult for them to be dominated and that is why companies should contribute to the growth of education in nigeria where we had the education tax then we also have the individual development income tax relief act which provided some kind of reliefs for individuals who have to pay tax then the stamp duties of recent times we have seen that stamp duties have become a very important source of revenue to the federal government in the um, um, financial uh, uh, um, the recent uh, financial uh, reforms of uh, buari's administration we have seen that they have increased the tax base of stamp duties before we were not having uh, electronic stamp duties but today we have electronic stamp duties when you transfer off recently when they said when you make a transfer of money from one bank to the other from your mobile app you will be paying 50 naira you will be paying 20 naira if you accumulate how much was realized in this year generally compared to what was realized in 2019 the difference is over 600 percent of income to the federal government so just that little introduction so that is why the stamp duties as a tax is one major source of income to Nigeria. Now, what are some key things we tax in the stamp duty? When you buy a land, particularly in the local areas, when we buy land, we go and register it. Uh, we make the agreement. We also get the survey plan. We do not go to the relevant authority to register it. And if that land, which is a legal document, is not registered, then that particular document cannot be tendered in court because you cannot claim ownership of that particular asset. There are transactions that also require the payment of stamp duties, like bank drafts we take, and sometimes to some kind of uh, receipts we want to issue to people, they require the stamp duties. Next slide, please. Now, here you can see a list of taxes to be collected by the federal government. You also see those to be collected by the state government and others to be collected by the local government councils. At the federal level, the Federal Board of Inland Revenue is the relevant tax authority which collects tax for the federal government. That is FBIR, the Federal Board of Inland Revenue. So the service of the Inland Revenue collects tax for federal government. The types of tax federal government collects are listed there. At the state level, we have the State Board of Internal Revenue. It collects tax for the state government. Then at the local government level, we have the Local Government Revenue Committee, which also collects tax for the local government. So those are the different types of taxes uh, being collected in uh, Nigeria. Next slide. Next slide, please. When we collect tax, we need to compute the tax. That is the responsibility of the accountant. Computation of tax liability is very important. And uh, with my little experience and uh, some kind of audit works we have gone out to do, we came to realize that most parastatas, institutions, and MDs, they are not actually remitting the tax collected to the federal government. And that is one big challenge we are having in Nigeria. What is often limited to government is most times not even up to 10% of what is collect, being collected. The part, the remaining part is being shared among themselves. So I think government need to take a critical look at the account of what has been collected in taxation, particularly on the area of payee, pay as you earn, people who have been employed. What is being remitted should be critically looked at to improve the, the economic situation of Nigeria instead of depending on oil uh, uh, revenue at all times. However, we want to look at the computation of tax. When we compute tax, we are looking at 
For personal income tax, we are looking at two key elements. What is income? And if you look at that place, the income to be taxed has to do with salaries, wages, fees, allowances, and other gains or profit from businesses people have been involving themselves. They are classified as incomes to be charged. Then when we get the income, we also have some kind of incomes that are tax-free, like what we call frank investment incomes. Frank investment incomes are tax-free. Then we also provide some kind of allowances for people who pay tax. Then there are some expenses that are not allowed by tax authority. A principal example of those expenses is depreciation. Why tax authorities do not allow the deduction of depreciation from taxable income before calculating the tax liability is because depreciation is a notion. You do not pay that money to anybody as an organization. If you look at the profit and loss statement, there is salary, there is stationary, there are bills. All those transactions in the PL, money was actually paid to somebody. There is outflow of cash. But in the case of depreciation, there is no real outflow of cash. And that's why the tax authority will not let it to be recorded as an liable ANSYS before putting tax liability. Now we have a, a case study there on personal income tax. So we now go to the next slide to see how we can analyze that case study. You can see the computation of personal income tax. The first thing in that computation is a end income. End income refers to how much that in that question, the individual taxpayer end as what he works for. Then we now had the on end income. On end income means other benefits an employee enjoys in an organization, which he did not spend money to acquire. For example, a manager of a company may be given an official car to use. A manager of the company may be given a residence to occupy. Those are on end incomes. In the tax law, those incomes are also taxable. And that's why we combine the end income and the on end income together. Then we also have the plus annual income. That is the combination of the end income and the on end income. After getting that, there are key basic deductions we make from that income, taxable income. We deduct tax reliefs. We deduct statutory consolidated uh, tax. This statutory consolidated tax came into being in the Finance Act of recent times, because when we talk about uh, tax reliefs, there are some kind of arguments. Sometimes the law will say five children are allowed, and a particular person who is not even married will be recording five children as his dependents. So government decided to consolidate all of them in one. If you like, have 20 children, that consolidation is what we carry. If you like, have five, one child, that consolidation will go. That's why we have the statutory consolidated relief. Then we also have some kind of incomes that are not taxable, we minus them. Now let's look at the tax rate of the personal income tax. The personal income tax rate is 25%. However, the rate grade because we are using a, a progressive tax system in Nigeria. So if someone is earning up to 300,000 Naira as the net profit remaining, then the person will pay a tax of 7%. If someone adds another 300,000, that is a total of 600,000. The first 300,000 will take 7%. The next 300,000 will take 11%. The next 500,000 we take 15%. The next 300, I mean 500 and the 500,000 we take 19%. But in this example, you see there, the next one is 340,000. It doesn't mean that that is the value. The value is what is above the up we have calculated. The remaining balance to make up the next 500,000 will take 19%. That is how we calculate tax liability for personal income tax. Next slide. Now we are looking at the company income tax. The company income tax is not like the personal income tax. 
we are looking at the net profit reported by the company in the first instance. Then we now add back those expenses that are not allowed, that have been deducted as expenses in the profit and loss account. We add them back. You can see number one, depreciation, which I said is not allowed. We also add back some kind of donations people make to organizations and treat them as expenses in the p &L. For example, someone may make a donation to an orphanage home where the person's close relation is there in the orphanage home. That kind of donation will not be recognized as a tax liable expenses. So here, yeah, I use the word donation to OBA. If you are donating anything to your traditional ruler, that is a personal service you want to give. It doesn't make any contribution to the survival of your organization. But donations to professional bodies or societies where your business belongs to or unions, they are recognized as taxable, uh, I mean, tax deductible expenses. So then another thing I want to mention there is capital allowance. I've mentioned that depreciation is not allowed. However, that doesn't mean that companies should not be compensated for acquiring huge instruments, equipment, plants to produce goods and services for the nation. When a company acquires that, the government compensates them by giving them capital allowance, although it is limited to some extent. Next slide. The role of corporate secretaries in information management. We know that in every organization, information is key to the success of the organization. And as corporate secretaries, they are the nerve of the management of information in an organization. And that is why they need to understand the financial statements of an organization. And when you look at Karma 1990, we are told that only three professions are qualified to become corporate secretaries in Nigeria. The chartered secretary, the accountant, and the lawyer. These three professions are stated in the uh, Company Allied Matters Act as the qualified professions to become secretaries of an organization. And that is one reason why as secretaries generally, be it a lawyer, be it an accountant, or be it a trained secretary, need to have a knowledge of accounting in an organization. Another thing we want to look at is that the financial statements we are talking about, the content of the financial statement, the structure of any financial statement we prepare is in the Nigerian law, particularly the public sector accounting is in the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So accounting, whatever we do is guided by relevant laws, even in taxation, in auditing, in financial accounting, except in management accounting, whatever they do is guided by relevant laws. And that is why our secretaries who are also close to the accountants and lawyers in an organization need to have a basic understanding of financial statements. Then let's look at the system theory. The system theory helps us understand that an organization is made up of several units which are of systems on their own. And the secretary, as I said, is a key point rallying around these several units. And accounting is also a unit in the system theory. The administrative section is also a unit in the system theory. And if the system theory doesn't work in an organization, there'll be gold in Congress. The objectives of the organization cannot be achieved. That is why for the purpose of the system to function effectively, the secretary must also know or have an idea of the financial statement the company prepares. Then finally, we look at the role theory. The role theory is simple. It helps us understand that in any organization you are, you are playing a role. And your role is not separated from other people who are playing their own role. Although you have your distinct functions to perform, but you must come together. When role theory is introduced in an organization, everybody will work together. And when everybody works together, it's then the organization will be able to achieve its objectives. Every role theory have a role model and role spectator. The secretary is a role model. The accountant is a role model. The administrator is a role model. At the same time, each of these three persons I've mentioned are role spectators. That means as a secretary, you expect something from the accounting unit. And if you don't have an understanding of how the accounting unit functions, you will not be able to know what you expect from them. The same thing with the accountant. He expects something from the secretarial department. So if you don't have an understanding, 
you will not be able to know what you expect. And that is why we are all role uh, spectators. So the role model must perform to the satisfaction of the expectation of the role spectators. And if that happens, there will be good Congress in an organization. Next, next slide. In summary, I've talked about the information system that accounting is like a subsection of the management information system of an organization. And we came to realize that accounting as an information system is the most regulated information system in the world because everything being done by anybody in an organization ends up in accounting. We now translate the summary of every other activity in monetary terms. That is why the accounting information system is very important. And that is why it is the most regulated information system in the world. Then for corporate secretaries and administrators, they are the key to the corporate governance of an organization, especially the secretaries. The management or the achievement of corporate governance objectives in an organization lies with the secretary of that organization. And that is why the secretary must have a very vast knowledge of everything that happens in an organization. Then we also have the corporate social responsibility. Organizations should be able to pay tax and the payment of tax is part of the corporate social responsibility of an organization. And when all that is achieved, then we'll be able to have a successful and vibrant co corporations in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Really, really enjoyed all the three speakers. To begin with, was uh, we started the, pre the presentation actually started with uh, Mrs. Umbano, who presented on the topic, uh, uh, the dynamics of accounting and administration in the execution of the role of the Chartered Secretary. And she dealt on, he dealt on pension and intellectual properties and went further to the second, sec second presenter, who is uh, the person of Mr. Uh, uh, Frederick Edogutu, who presented on um, human resources administration, recruitment and selection, discipline and termination. And finally, we had uh, Dr. James presented his part on understanding financial statements and taxation. In all, we want to say thank you very much and we want to switch over to the next uh, part, which is a uh, question and answer to be handled by Madam Peace George. We appreciate and thank Mrs. Ibene Pamela, Mr. Frederick Edogotu, and Mr. Dr. James Oyadoga. We are very grateful for the presentations. So we have one question for you. So please, what role? Dr. James, can you hear me? Yeah. Dr. James, yeah, please. So please, what role? Yes, I'm can the you. Okay, please, what role can I'm the company secretary? You. I'm on the question, sir. Say, please, what role okay. can a company secretary or an accountant play to prevent multiple taxation from various government revenue collection bodies? Okay. Uh, when you talk about revenue collection bodies, the corporate secretary will not have much to do on the area of revenue collection body. I'm saying this because the revenue collection bodies are relevant legal authorities established. And the revenue collection bodies have a guideline, like we have mentioned the kinds of taxes to be collected by the different governments. And so except the revenue collection body is going outside its own limit of tax to be collected. Otherwise, the corporate secretary will not actually ensure whether multiple tax this thing can be stopped. However, a corporate secretary who is not an accountant, who has no knowledge of taxation, still have a very important role to play by ensuring that the financial statements are accurately presented. The accurate presentation of financial statement does not necessarily mean that you should be an accountant. Let me give a very simple example, typographical errors. I'm now looking at the, the, the computer operator, typographical errors. And as a corporate secretary, this document will get to you before it will get to the manager of the organization. 
So a very careful and knowledgeable corporate secretary will be able to identify these errors. And having this knowledge of accounting will now help you to know what taxes your company or your organization is liable to pay. That is also one very important thing. And as we have mentioned, secretaries are sometimes lawyers too. And everything we do in accounting is backed by the law. So I will not want to say that a lawyer who is a corporate secretary will not understand which taxes the organization is supposed to pay. So that knowledge will help you to prevent payment of multiple taxes in an organization. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. James. The questions for you say concerning the outbreak. Can you hear me, please, Dr. Uh, Mr. Frederick? Mr. Frederick, can you hear me? Okay. Say, so please, the outbreak of COVID-19 has created a new normal regarding work relationships. In terms of discipline, for those who work from home, how can companies control appropriate behavior? The outbreak of COVID-19 has created a new normal regarding work relationships in terms of discipline. For those who work from home, how can companies control appropriate behaviors? That's one. If you can go ahead and answer that for as the next question. Okay. Okay. Um, people don't need to be in one place before discipline can be administered. Uh, people who are working remotely, people could be given targets and they don't meet their guests. Company can still administer discipline wherever they are. So discipline is not actually restricted. It might not just be uh, the normal may be coming to work late or whatever, which the person need to have uh, an interaction with the office. But apart from those aspects that people need to have constant interact interaction with the office, people will also need to do their jobs and then tax and targets are, are given to people. Uh, KPIs are given and then a ways of monitoring is also instituted. So if people are not meeting up, uh, the results would actually show. And when those results shows, um, the company would definitely administer the necessary discipline. It could be suspension, it could be uh, withdrawal of position, it could be um, pay cut if the employment uh, letter also agree to that, the contract also agree to that. It could be demotion or whatever. So it is still discipline that is uh, applied. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. That is so, the way sir, I will answer the question. Okay, sir. So also flowing from the first question that was asked, in terms of recruitment, what are the effects of undertaking this process completely visually? Okay. In terms of recruitment, what are the effects of undertaking this process completely visually? Um, sometimes uh, it's good that people have now come to know that people don't need to be in the office to get things done because of this COVID-19. Uh, the, the, the recruitment process can actually uh, be undertaken without even seeing the person because if we really understand what the recruitment is all about, uh, except when we get into the aspect of the selection process, which is also still done virtually. But at the end, for me, before the person resumes, there's a need for the person to present uh, himself. Maybe a verification of documents uh, to know if they are original and then still see the person face to face, person that is being employed. But those ones too, those measures do not really affect the performance of the person. Uh, I can scan my document, you can scan a document to someone and then uh, if the company can verify or do a background check without the person uh, physically present. So I think it has little uh, issues about it. Okay. That's all for now, sir. Well, thank you very much for thank that you. question. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. These other questions, we will answer them and send it to our various emails. Thank you very much to all our presenters. We are very grateful and we appreciate your time. God bless you. On behalf of the um, East and Rivers chapter, my name is Celine Okoroma Vincent. I've been the host for today's webinar. I want to thank every participant, particularly everyone who has carried it us to the end of today's event. 
As a matter of fact, as we all know, our speakers prepared a very delicious intellectual three-course meal. But like every meal, you know, there are bones and hard lumps as well, which presented itself in the form of the network glitches we had. But I'm glad that you still digested the information in spite of the minor interruptions here and there. So really appreciate all our participants for finding the time to connect with us and, you know, digest the information we've received today. Thank you so much for your time and attendance. We want to appreciate uh, Mrs. Ibienem Banner. As a matter of fact, our speakers are very busy people, as you can tell, because they had to sacrifice the time to be here. Getting them on board to even um, consent to taking the presentation was quite a challenge. But in spite of it, they were here and they've done their presentations and they've magnanimously left their slides available, which we'll be sending across to participants at the end of this presentation. We also want to thank Dr. James Keroto Adoha. As a matter of fact, last night when we had um, a test run for the pre-webinar for today, he was driving home at about 7 p.m., but he still tried to ensure that he connected and got um, a feedback on the other proceedings for today. And he's also on his way to another trip, just that's why he logged out. But the question for him, which hasn't been attended, will be sent to the emails of all participants. So we really appreciate him for the time and for sparing two hours of his time to be with us before he had to quickly dash up. So thank you, Dr. James. And if you notice, their contact details are on the screen. So possibly if you want to reach out to them because for our previous webinars, webinars we've had people ask for the contact details of our, our presenters to probably reach out to them for further questions or to possibly reach out to them for consultancy services. So we've projected their contact details. So if you can quickly take it down, if you're interested, you have that available as well. Then we also have um, Dr. Um, Mr. Frederick Edogotu. Mr. Frederick has so graciously spent the entire day with us, right from yesterday up until today as well. He logged in very early to ensure that he was a part of the success of this webinar. So we're so grateful to you, Mr. Frederick, for your time. Mr. Frederick is a very seasoned HR professional from the presentation. You can tell that he's grounded, not just in the theory, but in the practice of HR profession. So you can also reach out to him if for eventual you need someone to manage your recruitment services for your organization. He's readily available because he's a management consultant as well. So thank you so much, Mr. Frederick, for your time. Then the other information I have for you, we are available on social media. We are, you can reach out to us via email. If you're interested in a certificate of participation, because if a number of people have reached out to us, request for a certificate of participation for the webinar. So if you're interested in that as well, you can send us an email at the email projected at your screen and we'll try and make that available to you. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Before now, we had a Twitter account, but you all know what's happening in Nigeria with Twitter, so I can't put that on now. But uh, for now, we still have Facebook and Instagram available. So that's all for now from us. We want to appreciate you on behalf of the Education Committee of the Ixan Rivers chapter. They are the team members that have been responsible for bringing this webinar live to you. We thank each and every member of the team, and we hope that we'll be able to host you next time at a better and a bigger platform and a more interesting topic. So from all of us at Ixan Rivers chapter, I thank you, and then um, we hope to see you next time. Over to you, Mr. Margarita. We would be calling on our shaman if he's still on ground to give us the word of thanks so that we can officially close our webinar for the day. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, the moderator. Are you hearing me? You are welcome, sir. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Moderator. You have done a, a, a splendid job. It's your first time, but you think that's your own thing. Thank you, Mrs. Peace George. Welcome. Even at the anchor, you remain like um, the rock of Gibraltar all through the program. You have no way to escape, unlike us, who, who <laughs> could um, <laughs> take off on and off a little bit. Welcome to the man for her expertise, for her resilience and um, excellence in the discharge of her duties. We thank our general secretary for plugging, <coughs> crossing the T's and not in the eyes from the background. Kinelo, Wago, a lot of our members who are there with us want to express our gratitude to all of you for making it happen. 
you are very grateful as a chapter and we trust God that by the next exercise it will be better. So I want to thank everybody on behalf of the chapter and the issues at the national level bless us all and keep us alive till the next webinar. God bless you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>